Hello, hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so uh, you're here today, I assume, to see uh, Mola Industry. Um, Paolo Pedrosini um, is hiding in the back. Um, the human being behind the, <laughs> the name. Oh, I should be like here? Yeah, you could hide behind the wall. There you go. <laughs> um, so this is going to sound like boilerplate, but it's actually really uh, true um, for this talk. I'm really excited to have Paolo here. Um, I think uh, Paolo's, to my mind, one of the maybe 10 most, you know, in the, in the 10 or 5 or 3 or 2 or 1 most interesting game designers working today. Um, and for the past, um, I don't know, how many years has it been? Since 2003. So almost 10 years. Um, the projects you might have even heard of already, um, a lot of his projects have sort of bled beyond the indie game community or the art community. So I think the most out there project. The first one I saw was a McDonald's game, which was basically a McDonald's simulation game um, put out online um, where you sort of go back through the whole production cycle of McDonald's from farming the beef and uh, torturing the employees and vice versa. Um, and uh, the McDonald's game uh, you know, these games have been played by, I don't know, millions of people online, so Paolo's also one of those people that really uses the internet to its full potential as a distribution model. I don't think any of the games are distributed, per se, through any third party or second party. There's no... The iPhone, there is now the iPhone, which is a whole other story. Um, but some of the other games that we'll see um, are uh, Oligarchy, um, I guess you're going to skip Pedo Priest. Uh, <laughs> um, phone Story, a new game about the iPhone production uh, process. And uh, Unmanned, a new game from this year or last year. Um, exciting new game. Um, but really, in general, I think what's great about Paolo's work, it shows the potential for games to really bridge this boundary, which is between serious games and fun games. It's kind of one of the conundrums and paradoxes of how do you make games not just about the silliest things in the world, and how do, but how do you prevent them from being these dry simulations, you know, something kind of, oh, it's a serious game. And I think Paolo's approach of mixing the inherent qualities of gameplay and, and this visual sort of exuberant design and generally pretty serious political issues um, a really, really inspiring approach and almost, you know, one of few solutions to this um, paradox of games that I think a lot of game designers struggle with. You know, how do you deal with this sort of really kind of cheery, fun thing when you want to say other things? So, as a rambling introduction, but excited to have Paolo here. So. Well, I want the list, the list of your top ten game designers now, like top three or something. So uh, this is a silly one, but I, I, I met some people that are, oh yeah, you're you're the guy who made the Jesus uh, game. So. Thank you for having me. So my name is Paolo Pedercini, spell, spelled that way. I'm from Italy, but um, I've been living in the United States for a bunch of years now. Um, uh, at this point, I generally pose, uh, pass as an artist, uh, but I'm not, I'm not that kind of artist interested in uh, this uh, sort of like white space, uh, aseptic uh, 
uh, kind of like beautiful, mostly white people. Um, I, I'm more like interested in, uh, in the cultural practices that kind of try to trans transcend the spaces and these uh, venues. I'm more specifically more into this huge uh, uh, network of media, of content that is spread virally through, through the internet, uh, like b this network created by bored office workers and uh, bored uh, uh, students and uh, housewife, uh, even like more and more. So like this idea that uh, this kind of like a network that is uh, created by, by social network, but not, not only social networks, but emails and uh, instant messaging. And so I'm interested in uh, sort of injecting some kind of radical offbeat meme in this uh, endless flow of crap, essentially. Uh, so uh, most of my work is released under this project name, Mall Industria, that stands for uh, soft industry or soft factory. Um, this is a personal project I sometimes collaborate, uh, but it started in uh, 2003, and um, um, it's kind of, uh, it deals with uh, ideology or, and uh, entertainment, or as an artist would say, it explores the intersection between ideology and ent entertainment. Um, so the idea is uh, to combine basically the uh, the old idea of social communication or media activism in a, in a way, uh, together with the deconstructionist approach of cultural jamming. Uh, so like on, on one side, basically using game to spread alternative messages, like this one was made for a referendum about uh, stem cell research. So it was kind of like a propaganda game about a very specific issue for a very specific mo moment, very specific uh, situation. But on the other hand, uh, it's uh, about kind of like, like e basically deconstructing and uh, messing with the language of video games, sort of, sort of creating these uh, products that are, uh, in, in a way, self-reflective, and uh, in a way about, uh, about the game culture itself. So this is an, ex an example. <coughs> Fate Fighter, which is a straightforward fighting game, except you have these uh, characters that are um, gods uh, and uh, and um, basically, yeah, religious uh, figures from uh, the main religions fi fighting each other with um, special moves that are somewhat uh, accurate. Um, so it's kind of like a crass, op oversimplified allegory of the cultural clash. So this, this is another uh, game that sort of plays with the idea and with the, with the cliche and visual layout of a uh, fighting game. So it's like a, a fighting game in which everything, oh, there's no sound. <laughs> you can't imagine though. Um, uh, it, it basically plays, plays with the, uh, this idea of fighting game except everything is reversed. So instead of having people like fighting each other, you have people having uh, some kind of intercourse. Instead of having very hypersexualized, uh, kind of like um, stereotypical gender figures, uh, characters, you have this uh, silhouette that are kind of androgynous and they also switch and uh, warp uh, uh, their uh, sexual orientation according to their desire. So that's a kind of, their, their move is becoming, becoming some, some, somebody else. Um, so like instead of, you know, like, uh, sucking the energy away, you give pleasure, you suck, you suck something else. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but the thing that really intrigues me the most is uh, uh, basically working against this idea that games are, have a, a specific function in society, which is escapist, essentially. That they provide imaginary worlds, and you know, like saving princesses, and uh, uh, collecting money, collecting points, uh, leveling up, uh, eating mushrooms, sort of imagining to be in these magic kingdoms, and this is where, where I disagree with Ido <laughs> to some extent, because he likes that stuff, um, acquiring new powers. Uh, so like this idea that games are essentially wish-fulfilling fantasies that are here to enable you to live uh, a sort of like alternative uh, world, and, and uh, in a way, uh, they are here to make up for uh, the inequality and injustice in the world, sort of to, to give you another, a second chance in, a, in another second life in which you can be a, a hero or um, general or whatever. So uh, in order to counter this, I like to 
to basically propose so this is a uh, this is a game in which you uh yeah. this is a game in which you basically uh are in the in this uh, kind of awkward role of uh, of a woman uh, faking an orgasm and it's promoted as a, as a tool for like teaching people to 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 do that and uh <laughs> and um it's sort of also like playing with the with, with the idea that most of the players at least like most of the players and this this came out in 2003 so most of the players at least in my mind were uh, uh, male essentially and so like I, wa I wanted to have dudes uh, playing this role and sort of like uh, having a reverse shot a reverse first person shot like you you are basically just clicking this button it's it's kind of like a rhythm game a music game in which you are you, you try to match your moans uh, to your boyfriend's moans and, uh, and eventually you you have to basically reach the orgasm when he does So annoying. Uh, another game that uh, sort of uh, uses this uh, uh, awkward uh, role playing is uh, Tube of Flex, which is uh, a game set in a, in a sort of, I was at the time it was a distant future, but it was like a, kind of like a near future uh, um, uh, in which there is a, uh, a, a sort of like corporation that is managing labor all around the world and created this uh, systems, uh, system of pipes uh, in, in that basically transfer workforce, transfer workers from a place to another in real time according to the market demand. So you, you're playing one of these uh, this, uh, poor like uh, workers and, uh, and you have a shitty job and then uh, you do well and you get another shitty job at random in some other part of the universe. And that's what pretty much is happening uh, since uh, at least like since the 70s to people who, you know, who don't have uh, a degree or stuff like me, like, uh, like, like it was at the time. Um, so you can be an unemployed. And, uh, and uh, eventually, uh, like every error you make, there are sort of mini game, uh, kind of Mario, Mario where, where mini game. And uh, every error you make, uh, you, get, you get some uh, chances down. And uh, eventually, uh, you you are expelled from the labor market. Like that's that's me trying to get to the labor market. And oh well, well there, there is there is a scene in which you end up uh, as a homeless guy, and uh, you you get to play to play the harmonica. And uh, according to many people, that that's a sort of like relief. That's the best part of the game, game wise, because it, it's more entertaining. Uh, anyway. Uh, this is a more recent one, and it's uh, called Every Day the Same Dream. It's dealing with the similar themes of labor and alienation, but with a different sort of perspective, different mood. So in this game, you're this sort of uh, faceless, uh, one-dimensional man that gets up every day and uh, goes to work, and uh, you really have this left and right control and plus you can interact with obvious elements. Um, it apparently poses no challenges because it's fairly linear, it almost uh, seems like an introduction to the, to the game. I'm just gonna play this. Similar. There's not a lot of uh, openness in, the, in that sense. Then you finally find your cubicle. And the game starts over. So, uh, 
and, uh, and there's nothing really different. So you can uh, be basically stuck in this cycle forever. Um, it poses no challenges except for the, the lady in the elevator is basically giving you a hint that maybe something might happen to like you want to become a new person, a different person. So uh, if you play again, and a lot of people actually uh, play this way and you were like, oh, that's really nice. So it's like this sort of like conceptual not game uh, that seems to be a game, but it's not. No, it, it, actually it is a kind of game. There are things that you can do. Uh, there are basically several different ways to subvert uh, your everyday life. For example, you can go this way instead of going that way, or can, you can show up at work uh, and basically in underpants, or you can just get out of the car on a traffic jam and uh, just pet a cow. And then, but when you discover that there's uh, sort of subtle variations from the norm, uh, uh, there is a kind of resolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, luckily, as uh, luckily as some people know, know noticed, uh, I don't really have a, a cubicle job like that, so it's not really a personal thing. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of things about um, about the next game and about my personal situation. I don't work in a cubicle. No, I currently live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I work in this uh, building here that is part of Carnegie Mellon University. Now, um, it's great. It's a beautiful building, and uh, and um, and it's a great, uh, amazing city. Uh, now, if you go down down that that basically down that way uh, on the left part of the frame, uh, you basically um, uh, end up like in front of a, of a building, kind of like a building you cannot get in, not even with a car, that is called the Robotics Institute. Uh, they make robots there, right? And this was made, this was made in uh, Carnegie Mellon University. You might have seen it. Some of them uh, are, are cute, some other are uh, are a little freaky. Like this is also from Pittsburgh. I'm kind of like pitching my town. <laughs> Let's see. Huh? Uh, the the robot the robot just just climbs on the tree. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, this uh, this this one is a little scary. It's called the Crusher. Like, and. Uh, they are all pretty much founded by the U.S. military. Um, this is a, fly, hum, a flying uh, Humvee that can fly without a pilot. Like, what can possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's called the Transformer. <laughs> um, so, uh, if you go down the riverside, you end up in this uh, in this place that is uh, um, uh, is called the Entertainment Technology Center, which is also part of Carnegie Mellon University. It's a really nice place, and that's how it looks inside. There is a spaceship deck. There are robots here too. This 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 time they are kind of like fictional robots. They are like uh, um, from Star Wars and stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, at the center they make. Uh, but it's called the Entertainment Technology Center, and they make things like video games and uh, uh, theme park rides, and they do military research. So. This is a sample of the student projects, basically. I went there one day, I visited, and I just like grab a, grabbed a handful of pamphlet, uh, little, little like flyers, and so that's what they do. Like they have an educational game uh, and bombers, but not a game about stealth bombers. No, actually technology that works for like uh, stealth bombers. Uh, they have a, what is this? Like oh, a game for hospitalized children, because Pittsburgh is also a very important uh, hospital and um, um, hub, and then there are this project called Panoptics, that is uh, kind of like a surveillance uh, uh, project for Lockheed Martin, and um, and then they have like uh, other educational stuff and uh, other more scary stuff. So uh, this is not really that weird and unusual. There is even a name for that, which is the military uh, military entertainment complex. So, on a personal level, I kind of had to deal with this because it was part of my, well, I've been a U.S. Uh, taxpayer for, for a few years now, and uh, this stuff was basically indirectly founding basically my bills, my, my, th that was my uh, stipend, when my wage, my salary was coming from, uh, from this sort of complex. Um, 
And as you probably know, the, conver uh, the convergence between uh, uh, military and games uh, uh, has been around since, since the games themselves, really. Like the first game, uh, well, the first proper game was created at MIT and it was sort of basically a, a spin-off, like an independent project from a kind of like a very militarized institution. This is a, this is a uh, um, video art, but it's sort of like a documentary uh, about serious games that shows uh, some scenes from uh, like games that are actually used to train to train soldiers and uh, and this not, doesn't really happen only on a this convergence doesn't really happen only on a cultural uh, level the the current uh, sort of revolution in uh, uh, robotic warfare uh, is often in media, at least in pop culture, is often associated with with games. So you'd have these drones flying somewhere else, and uh, so I, w I was already thinking that maybe the best way to deal with that uh, was was with, with a game. But it's not a very easy task uh, uh, because we reached a point in which, really, like it's almost hard to understand. It's pretty much impossible to 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 figure out uh, basically uh, war represented. You know, like the real war or the the war in in, uh, in games. So one of those, I don't remember which one. One of those is from video games, and the other one is from actual footage. So it's almost indistinguishable, like from a visual level, but also from a, a, an experiential, almost like interaction design level, because because the soldiers are basically remote controlling this uh, this uh, airplanes with using joysticks, and sometimes they are even like inspired by actual uh, game controllers. And uh, moreover, there are also, uh, it's basically the premise of this kind of warfare is to fight a war in a, basically without suffering the consequences. Pretty much like in a game, you are sort of somewhat protect, protected. So uh, for a while, I thought there's not much that you can do uh, to, to, to deal with that, to deal this, uh, with this uh, sort of like short circuit between war and, uh, and uh, entertainment. And the only position that you can take as an artist, as a cultural producer, as a sort of like produce, cultural producer with a, con uh, with a consciousness, or uh, you can basically only take a, a, a stance of refusal, like you can refuse the gaming, the gaming action. And uh, uh, a, a work that I really like is the, this, this uh, performance, sort of, it's somewhere between a performance and a memorial by uh, Joseph Delappe, who's an, uh, an artist, a uh, game artist, um, who will basically join uh, servers of um, America's Army, which is the propaganda game produced by the US military. And uh, he will just play, but not very proactively. He will just kind of hang out there. And uh, every time he gets shot, I think he's still doing this. Oh, probably, probably it's over, but he's been, he's been doing this uh, since, yeah, I, I guess 2006. For, for several occasions, every, and every time his uh, avatar gets shot and killed, he will just uh, use the internal in-game chat to basically uh, uh, write the name of a of a soldier, fo a fallen soldier in Iraq, the name and the uh, day of the yeah the day of uh, of death, and often uh, often kind of pissing people off. Generally, gamers don't really ap appreciate this uh, sort of uh, connection with reality. So, um, and there are several performances that are actually uh, intervening the spaces to create some kind of critical awareness, or at least like on a gestural level, try to point to this uh, to this issue. Now, uh, there's this thing that, uh, like, I, sometimes I use this quote that is uh, about obviously films uh, by Francois Truffaut, uh, basically claim that. All the movies are, in to some extent, pro-war, uh, because no matter what the message is, they inevitably make the action look exciting, because that's the magic of cinema, right? Uh, even if, uh, even like a, sort of like anti-war movies, like uh, a Full Metal Jacket or uh, Apocalypse Now, are kind of like highly regarded by people who kind of like military culture and war, so. Um, that's, I guess, the magic of, of cinema, this uh, kind of like visceral uh, fascination with human I images, with, with moving images that can uh, somewhat uh, neutralize the intellectual connection 
the intellectual engagement with the viewer. So, well, true false uh, solution, I guess, was to make basically uh, movies about love. Uh, <coughs> but uh, still, this, I think this, uh, this issue might remain, or it might be even worse in, uh, in gaming, because uh, games are way more centered on action. And that's probably not a coincidence that <coughs> the, uh, most of games have some kind of military theme, even when they are not as produced by the military. Mm -mm. So, uh, I also sort of dabble with this uh, aesthetic of uh, inaction, um, <coughs> using, reusing, sort of like trying to subvert this, uh, um, this uh, America's army that for a while was kind of like an obsession for a lot of artists. I think you, know, you, you made a, 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 mach a Machinima 2 way before me, obviously. Um, so this is a basic machinima video shot in America's army that um, takes basically sort of transforms the fast paced action. America's army, if you ever played it, I don't know. It's a, it's a fairly fast uh, uh, action, multi mostly multiplayer uh, games, similar to Counter Strike. So it doesn't really represent obviously the, the war as it, as it is. So I kind of try to neutralize this fascination with speed and uh, like um, a action and violence, and try to make a more like a meditative uh, sort of um, video, and um, in which the, the desert, instead of being um, generic Middle Eastern uh, scenario, is more like um, an internal personal landscape. And uh, this footage is basically interspersed with uh, question from, uh, questions from the um, post-traumatic stress disorder checklist, which is the, the, a questionnaire that they give to, uh, to veterans when they come back from war to basically see, uh, see if there are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are basically all wars from uh, uh, from uh, produced by the military, essentially. Anyway, I, li I, li I like this. That, that, was, that was interesting to make, to turn a game into a non-interactive thing. But still, I, I, was, I wanted to uh, address certain, like this specific issue of robotic warfare, war, war in 21st century, uh, using, uh, kind of like using the game form and using the power of interaction. So. So this is, uh, this is my most recent game, it came out uh, last month, it's called Unmanned and uh, it's about a day in the life of a drone pilot. So similarly to, it's a similar way to, to Every Day the Same Dream, you're, you, you are basically a white dude and you wake up every day and you go to work. Um, and it employs this uh, two channel video, two, two channel gameplay, that is something I sort of borrowed from uh, video art in which you have a a kind of uh, situation in which your attention is, has to be split in, uh, into sort of focal points. And you basically have, uh, um, a f always have two challenges that are happening at the same time. In this case, it's like very trivial stuff such as uh, shaving. And on the other side, there is an internal monologue uh, or a dialogue. So it's dual screen with a, a dual gameplay. That to me uh, sort of exemplified the sort of dissociation that uh, I assume that these pilots uh, must have. This, are, this would be a pilot that uh, lives in, uh, in the outskirts of Las Vegas and will wake up and go to, to Creech Air Force Base, which is uh, an hour north, and will just pilot these uh, uh, machines uh, on the other side of the world in Pakistan. So it's kind of experimenting with the idea of multiple choice that usually the multiple choice is sort of functional to your, uh, and you get some kind of achievement that sort of make fun of the, um, make fun of gaming culture and achievos, uh, and also the idea of gamification. I don't know, you might, you might have seen this uh, lecture by Justice Shell that is basically imagining a world in which uh, you get points for uh, brushing your teeth. So you have, I try to to take this literally and uh, making basically a game. Uh, from the eyes of a character that see his life as a game. <coughs>
So this is the commute scene, in which there's nothing much to do. You can go off road, and um, and then you eventually get to the to this uh, ground base operation that is uh, basically uh, it's kind of connected to Area 51 um, up there, and uh, and that's more or less the settings you have. You will have a pilot and a and a and a co-pilot, well, a pilot and a sensor, and you basically start to follow the, follow this thing, and at the same time, sort of interact to your uh, interact with your uh, colleague, and you can kind of flirt with your colleague, and you can end up basically with a uh, like getting a date or for for the weekend. So you constantly have to split this attention between between this this two action, which is. Uh, Kind of like a dualism between like kind of action and thoughts and a kind of language, which is uh, you can you can see it as a reference to the so-called ludo narrative dissonance. The the uh, there is a storyline that sort of conflicts between like conflicts with the uh, video game mechanics. So the chapter st structure is kind of rigid in the sense that uh, there are chapters that go like uh, one after the other, and there's no kind of way to to. Uh, radically change uh, the outcome, well, at least the order of these things. But that's that's something that I was interested in uh, in uh, exploring because uh, I didn't want to have a game in which there is a, a guy sort of mo moving around, right? Like most of games are, they're all mostly based on uh, sort of uh, bodies moving in space, and that's something I didn't want to have in here. I just wanted to to sort of like. Imagine a, an exploratory game that, in, in which, basically, the things to explore happen in a. What is this? Oh, all right, <laughs> it's out of it. Um, so uh, eventually, you 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 go back home and uh, and you have a, and you play a video game within a video game with your kid, and you sort of have to explain and you have conversation about about your your day life. Let's see. All right, I guess. So, on a so on a superficial way, th this game is fa fairly similar to Every Day the Same Dream, except in this case, like uh, Every Day the Same Gr Dream is kind of well, you have some spoilers, but there are different ways to play it because there are meaningful choice and different achievements you can get. So uh, the, st the structure is rigid, but uh, there are actually choices that make sense. They make meaning. Um, so uh, similar to Every Day the Same Dream in a, in a way, because it's also sort of somewhat cyclical. But in this case, uh, I wanted to have a more specific character. It has a has a name, has a job, has a specific position in time and space. Uh, and then you get to uh, sort of define the character with with your actions. So you have a character that is not defined in a dramaturgical sense, in a sort of like there is a script and uh, and uh, you relate with this character or you identify or you despise this character. But you get to choose if basically this uh, this main character is either like a jingoist uh, asshole or a kind of like depressive borderline uh, soldier, like just a, or or a bad good dad and bad bad dad. So <clears throat> this is a game about, uh, I like to think it about a game about uh, personal and technological disconnection, uh, which is a theme that run, runs through the gameplay and also in the lives of the characters. Uh, and it also, it's also a way to me like to connect, to connect with a sort of aspect of our everyday life, this sort of like shadow world that exists and is uh, so carefully removed from our experience. So it's uh, using fiction to sort of imagine what happens in this uh, uh, world that we are not really allowed to know because it's not, it's outside the basically public scrutiny. We don't, like few people know uh, what happens exactly in Yemen and Somalia and, uh, and Pakistan where actually US controlled drones are operating and sometimes killing people. So the idea is basically the CIA and the, uh, and the army are sort of creating these gaps. And I think we artists have to sort of fill these gaps and try to imagine and figure out what happens there and create a conversation, which is a premise that is similar to another project that I, work in, I worked on uh, a bunch of years ago. This is not my project. It's a project by uh, a, a collective of engineers uh, 
uh, uh, called the Institute of Applied Autonomy, it's called Terminal Air, and um, yeah, uh, uh, IAA was the name of the collective in collaboration with Tre Trevor Paglen, which is a great artist, probably top in my list of favorite artists. So the subject was this uh, classified program. Who, who knows what the rendition program is? Don't read, don't read the caption. <laughs> All right, so the rendition program is uh, this, uh, this uh, basically program uh, operated by, by the CIA that basically consisted in kidnapping, uh, suspected terrorism from everywhere in the world, really. One happened in Italy, uh, many, many happened in Europe or in the US. Basically kidnapping suspected terrorists and uh, taking them, flying them to a, a network of secret prison all around the world. And I know this seems like crackpot, uh, conspiration, but no, that's actually very well documented. So the CIA was uh, basically operating this civil flight and uh, we were trying, or well, we were actually uh, uh, following this flight and uh, sort of uh, cr um, create a data visualization about those flights because there is a way to basically uh, figure out which planes are operated by the CIA. And uh, so this uh, terminal, f uh, terminal air that I should play it again if only I wasn't using PowerPoint. Uh, you, you have basically this data visualization and this installation that was sort of imagining uh, a tourism a agency slash bureaucratic government office in which these uh, faceless bureaucrats are essentially flying uh, suspected terrorists. All right. Um, Now, all, all of these examples are essentially taking advantage of one characteristic of games that I really like. Uh, it's basically the role-playing part. Like, what, what is it like to be a drone pilot? I have no idea. I read some interviews, but I don't know. Like, that's, that's what the fiction comes. Or uh, what is it like to be uh, a, a woman faking orgasms and things like that. Uh, but I think there is a potential also from a very, like, almost the opposite approach, which is the sort of like top-down approach. Uh, so games are at their core systems, systems of rules. You can define them as uh, essentially, yeah, syst formal systems of rules. And uh, they are systems you get to interact, you get to explore. And the, one of the theories is that since games are systems, uh, they might be well suited to portray real world systems, such as the economical and the social ones. Um, yeah, like in a, in a sense better than a linear media, like uh, you get to play with a game, you explore it. Uh, it's like a, a learning a mechanism by playing around with a mechanism. So uh, I decided to test the, this idea and uh, there are like, uh, I'm making a game about, about McDonald's that Ido was mentioning before. Um, so there are many arguments against fast food, like it's not good for health, uh, uh, the restaurants are kind of depressing. Uh, this uh, top-down situation is like a position of power that allows you to see, exact, well, to see the network in a better way to play with this comprehensive system. So, yeah. So the idea is sort of to connect what the transnational globalized capitalism separates. You put it all together. Um, another, well, the same approach, the same uh, assumption is used in another management simulation that I released a few years later. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> so this is called oligarchy. And uh, it's somewhat similar, except it deals with uh, not a specific industry, but uh, more like a generic, uh, vertically integrated oil industry. There's no industry that is, uh, well, they changed a lot in the last 50 years, so they kind of merged and they got, they got separated, they got split. But anyway, you're uh, kind of like a generic uh, uh, ExxonMobil sort of industry uh, c uh, corporation. And this one deals more with the relationship between politics and the corporate world. So you, in, uh, it's crucial in the, to, to win this game, it's crucial to sort of uh, finance the parties that are more likely to win so they can uh, pass uh, laws and bills uh, and acts that 
can basically facilitate your your work uh, for example by uh, by uh, dismantling some public transportation system, which is what happened to Los Angeles, for example. And all the ev events are somewhat related to historical facts, and the, the, the game starts uh, after World War II and sort of follows, uh, follows the evolution of the oil industry till today, and even a little bit in the future. There are different outcomes, while the McDonald's video games uh, always end, uh, ends in tragedy or in kind of like devastation. This one <coughs> can actually become uh, like, can, can actually have a, a more like utopian ending. Um. So uh, you can possibly make a game like this for every industry. In fact, I keep I keep receiving requests. Oh, you should make a game about Starbucks. Uh, you should make a game about Walmart. And that, yeah, that's that's cool. That, do it. Um, um, but I thought it was more interesting to make it to make to get, make a game uh, about an industry that I'm more uh, kind of like related to, which is uh, well, you know, we tend to consider uh, communication, uh, digital, the digital world, and gaming as a substantially immaterial sort of industry, an immaterial sector, because we deal with symbols, we deal with, with numbers that are stored as um, one and zeros. But beneath this uh, informational surface, there is a fairly material uh, reality. Uh, so I wanted to make a game called, this, this, this is a phone story, I wanted to make a game that is basically uh, Exploring the dark side of this uh, of this economy, that is uh, the let's say technological consumerism. So the manufacturing and distribution and disposal of electronic gadgets, such as the iPhone that I also have, and the problem of technological consumerism that is essentially fueling uh, this uh, this eternal need of new gadgets. So the game basically depicts the various phases of the manufacturing process. Hello, consumer. So. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> Let me tell you the story of this phone while I provide you so with that's, quality So that's how, how it kind of looks. There is this voice that is part of the game. Once upon a time, there were minerals resting in the bowels yeah, of the Yeah, kind of like a straightforward... Uh, and uh, the, the, this is basically, imagine it coming from your phone. The phone basically talks to you and takes, takes its own life and it's telling you, hey, this is, this is where I come from. I come from uh, minerals that are mined in Congo. And uh, that's, that, that's an issue that is still not very much on the, in the spotlight. The fact that in uh, every single electronics we, we, we use and we consume, there is uh, this uh, coltan, this columbite tantalite that is a mineral used for uh, capacitors, basically. And it's, uh, it's a key element that is basically almost completely, like almost entirely mined in Congo. And Congo, there is a, like, a pretty terrible civil war that had, has been happening since the, oh my god, uh, I don't even remember. <laughs> Uh, but definitely there was a spike, an increase of violence uh, when uh, PlayStation 2 came out. And it was definitely related to, uh, to an increase in demand of Colton. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is about the manufacturing process, sort of a reference to the Foxconn uh, issue, like the fact that all, um, all the iPhone and a lot of 80%, I think, of the consumer electronics are manufactured in this big factory city called Foxconn in China, in which people are st started to, to commit suicide as a protest, essentially, for, for their like, inhumane condition and uh, or, or working hours. So this is when uh, like it kind of got a little bit more in the spotlight, the Foxconn case and the manufacturing case, because there are other associations working on that. But at that point, in, uh, toward the pretty much a year ago, uh, it was still some, somehow unknown. Anyway, this is, you have to feed the consumers with, uh, uh, kind of like crazy consumers to, with, with, with a new gadget. And then you co also, it also covers the uh, end of the cycle, basically the disposal of this, of this uh, gadgets and phones, which is uh, also very critical, and that's something that you cannot really solve uh, very easily by simply uh, improving working conditions, like uh, in the manufacturing phase. 
So the player basically performs these very simple gestures, almost automatic, because they are very simple games. They are kind of like arch archetypal, archetypical, archetypal. They are like um, move, avoid, uh, launch, angry birds, kind of stuff. Uh, so they are like really dumb stuff, and, and uh, you don't really realize what you do up until the voice that is always present basically tells you, uh, kind of draws the context around your action. So I wanted to mirror this sort of uh, automatic approach that we have with uh, games and with this technology, almost like it's magic, it's coming from nowhere, and then sort of like mimic mimicking the, yeah. This is another mode that is very similar, except it's more competitive. <coughs> So, the, the whole point was to create a game that is self-referential, and I wanted it to be uh, available on, uh, on the very iPhone or the Android phone that you use, so, so that the phone could basically speak, speak to you. And um, since, uh, there's, yeah, since I, w I also wanted to point uh, at these uh, groups and organizations that are actually working to solve these issues, I decided to uh, turn it into a, uh, a fundraising tool because it got approved uh, on the Apple Store and when it got the approval I was like, oh, okay, maybe we can make some money and donate some money to the people who are a pain in the ass for Apple or Google. And, uh, and, that, and that was the thing, except after, uh, after, what was it, like two hours, they sort of realized that the project was against Apple and so they pulled it from the market and uh, and it became actually it became like a very a very popular topic. It became a sort of like a big controversy in, within the game developers uh, community. People started to like it, it. It didn't really address these issues that I was trying to address, but at least it produced some uh, interesting conversation about uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression within these markets, such as the iTunes market or whatever console. Uh, run market in which you can uh, you can basically publish everything you want like uh, like uh, on the internet but everything has to be uh, approved and censored by by those corporations so eventually we, we made just like six six thousand bucks because uh, like in those two hours uh, that was uh, was up there and then we published it on on android but android is a really crappy market and <laughs> And uh, then we got some do donation from uh, uh, a couple of uh, art foundations that supported this, uh, <coughs> the production. So eventually it was just like uh, six grants and we donated it to uh, a worker, uh, a, a former Foxon worker in China that suffered from serious injuries after basically jumping off the factory. Uh, just, uh, she was working on that uh, in 2010. I think she's still paralyzed, I'm not completely sure. But she got the money, I promise. Um, so here's the point. Uh, now, with, with these games, I don't really just want to promote ideas, like that's a big important thing. But I also like to, um, to me, like another issue, another crucial issue is the issue of game literacy. I also want to unpack some of the uh, rhetorical um, artifacts that you can see in games. Basically, games and simulation are not uh, neutral representations. Like between a city, this is an example I always make, between a city and Sin City, it's not that there is like a linear process that you can possibly uh, compare to taking a picture, you know. Uh, there is basically a very elaborate process of modelization and within this process, well, in the middle of this process there is a person, usually a dude, uh, white, uh, that has his own uh, culture, his own uh, ideological uh, biases, it will have his uh, system of values, and this guy basically gets to choose what uh, gets in the simulation and what doesn't get in the simulation. And a lot of people noticed then and pointed to the fact that you'll never, how come that SimCity always represents a kind of like a North American city, pretty much like Los Angeles, kind of grid base, and there is no way to represent, at least in the first versions, in the earlier ver earliest versions. And how come that you never see um, 
racial riots, which, which are also a very important part uh, of uh, the evolution of big cities in America in the last century, like one of the key crucial uh, e events. So uh, they're not neutral representation. I actually wanted to push th this idea even a little, bit, a little bit further uh, by making a game that is uh, not just, uh, that is basically presented as, uh, as an interactive theory. So you can say that all the, all the games are basically representing a, uh, a point of view, especially all the games that are not abstract, all the games that, that are basically used as representational devices. Uh, and I wanted to make a game that sort of stress, stresses this, this idea by, um, by essentially exploring and modeling uh, uh, an idea, uh, an, a phenomenon that uh, was not easy, like was not representational, an, an abstract phenomenon. And uh, this, is, this was the conflict between uh, uh, free culture and, uh, and the copyright, basically this uh, kind of like eternal, semi-symbiotic uh, conflict that you have, a struggle that you have between uh, people trying to share uh, ideas and knowledge within a common sphere that's where the ideas happen, and then you have a, like a sort of market forces that are trying to commo commodify and suck this and suck this uh, these ideas and package them and redis redistribute them. So it's a little bit more complex than it looks, a slightly bit, still a very simpli simplistic kind of representation. But it was a proof of concept for for this idea. <coughs> so again. Uh, these ideas, uh, th these games are very ideological, very political, and they don't, pre don't pretend to be uh, realistic. Uh, they don't pretend to be um, neutrally portraying, oh, that's, that's what uh, uh, McDonald does, actually. Like, uh, that's, that's definitely what I believe, but I, I want to make sure that I'm making an argument that this is a rhetorical sort of construct. Because the point is, it's not really, just to show the structures behind McDonald's and the mechanics behind McDonald's, but also to show the degree of manipulation that can occur in these games. So in a way, it's, um, the idea is to uh, propose a, a new homeopathic remedy to the stupidity and the ideology of mainstream games. So uh, you can see some other games, including the, the infamous Pedopriest. <laughs> on the website that is uh, uh, malindustria.org. And um, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions. Hi. So I really appreciate that um, basically almost all of your games uh, are made up of a bunch of little mini games, uh, basically. It's something I really I try to do in my own design, and I appreciate whenever I see it, because it fights a lot of the homogeneity that you see in mainstream games. And I was wondering where that comes from, like what were your influences originally? <coughs> That's a great question, actually. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Oh, I thought it was me. Uh, no, that's a, that's, that's a really good question. It's, it's not completely true that, uh, that there are always mini games. Uh, um, I think I used that strategy in a few, few times, uh, several times, so I definitely am fine with that. Um, so here's the, here's the problem that you have as a, as a game designer. And whenever you try to model anything that is uh, somewhat uh, referring to real world situations, uh, the problem is that um, the rules of game design, the implied rules of good game design sort of require you to be uh, elegant and somewhat economical. Like that's what a good game is, like at least in the mainstream uh, sort of thought, like now that people like you, you'll hear over and over lecture if you attend uh, uh, conferences uh, in uh, uh, ma both uh, mainstream and independent game design. The idea is to make uh, kind of like to give you the highest depth uh, with the sort of like the least uh, amount of content and rules and stuff. So it turns out that reality doesn't really work like that. Uh, like it doesn't really work like a, a good uh, German board game. And uh, you have to deal with a lot of exception. And it's also a, an issue in terms of implementation because uh, if you like, if you're programming on a non-beginner level, you probably end up using object-oriented programming. 
and that sort of already in a, uh, force you to uh, systematize and generalize things in a, in a very specific way. Like uh, um, things are supposed to be reusable and uh, you're supposed to, in, to kind of like uh, be modular and stuff. So um, yeah, the problem is that it's very hard to create a comprehensive model that takes into account all of these things, especially when you're dealing with the daily life or a, of, of a guy. And, uh, and that usually is always resolved in, the ter in terms of like movements, all right? The guy moves from, from here to there, both 3D or, or, or 2D, and, um, and then interacts with another object. But that's, that's a very like object, uh, kind of like material object oriented thing. I'm, I'm a kind of a lazy person. I don't spend too much time walking around. Uh, but that's what pretty much you do in games all the times. Then if you have something more like uh, introspective or something more uh, dialogical, generally there is a cutscene of some kind of a non-interactive session. So anyway, like to me, the use of mini games and a very like very non-homogeneous sort of st game structure is a way to deal with complexity of a very messy reality. Hey, how you doing? Um, I, I noticed in your games, which I like very much, and I like the criticism of uh, military and and capitalist models. Uh, it's inspiring, so I think, oh, maybe I'm gonna do like a really fun communist game, you know, because uh, <laughs> it seems to be eradicated, you know, maybe through game. Play it could sort of reintroduce like a, a sponsoring, like providing a good uh, functional communist. Yeah, like right, like the functional communist game, like a yeah, perfect yeah. utopia. Um, yeah, that was like my second game idea, <laughs> 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 in 2004. No, actually, it might be it might even be the, the first one, one of the. Sorry, sorry to, to cut you up, but uh, yeah, please. One <laughs> of the first, uh, uh, like kind of like uh, inspiration I had uh, was this essay that was from a guy that kind of disappeared. I think it was called Ted Freeman. Friedman that uh, was called Making Sense of Software. In which he was basically saying, uh, kind of like a more like a nice, <laughs> nice way of what, I, what I've been saying. Like, uh, it's hard to imagine a movie uh, based on Karl, Mar Karl Marx's Capital, but it's m easier to imagine a video game based on that. So that's th that's probably where it's a, it's an es essay about Sim City, and uh, sort of like uh, celebrating and kind of like uh, envisioning this. Uh, uh, how games can be used to think about, uh, th to think in terms of complexity. Anyway, continue with your question. No, I, I this is great. Can, I, can we just kind of wrap like this? <laughs> the whole <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm just curious because there's a lot of uh, criticism, kind of critique embedded in your games, but like, you know, so much criticism, there isn't a lot of solution. And, and I wonder, like, is there a game in the works that actually offers like an antidote so does that if that makes any sense like there's an empathetic moment in a lot of your games mm -hmm. pet a priest is one i never would have imagined what it was like to be you know kind of representing the catholic church in a scandal but by playing your game i i embody that character mm -hmm. um so the empathetic moment is there but i wonder is the solution yeah that's 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 a good one too um so here's the thing um I'd like to be, uh, I'd like to point to some kind of direction and I'm definitely more into, into critique because I'm kind of like a jerk, I guess. But that's, that's kind of like the problem with like leftists in general. <laughs> but um, uh, the problem is that uh, it's very hard to make a game about like solving global warming without being pres prescriptive essentially, without saying, all right, this is the solution and global warming is essentially a puzzle that we, we are here to solve. Uh, I'm more into the idea that society works in a less organic way, in a less puzzle-like way, which is kind of like the Jane McGonigal uh, ideology of like so fixing the, uh, uh, a mechanism, a reality that is broken, like uh, it was like a clock or something, uh, and more like, uh, outlining sort of power differentials and power uh, uh, structures. So uh, to me, like from the kind of like the evil side is, is, is easier to show this because you get to play the disempowered McDonald's worker all day, like or the disempowered worker all day. So you, you have uh, less chances to see the world from a, from a, the, the, 
the enemy you know, in a way. So to me, it's, it's just important to outline uh, this uh, kind of uh, conflicts that happens. Then uh, how to fix this, how to solve this. Uh, I have my own ideas and sometimes they are there indirectly, like in oligarchy, basically you can reach a, a post-carbon society if you, essentially if you are a very bad player. Like if you are a, a terrible C uh, CEO, uh, the, um, what happens is that you don't really found politics, you are not interested in politics, just interested in making money. And uh, so what happens is that the game system uh, adapts itself uh, and basically society respond to a scarcity of oil uh, almost automatically by basically oh, promoting bike culture and public transportation, uh, re uh, urbanization as opposed to sub suburbanization and things like that, green energies and so all sorts of stuff that can actually happen in the game if you don't uh, basically try to uh, intervene in politics. So in a way that shows up in the game, except not in a direct way, because I don't want to be, oh, here's the solution. But there are a lot of games that, that do that. Like, in, like if you check uh, games for change or the serious games, most of them are to sort of like uh, kind of imbue the player with a very specific process to solve this problem. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just more of a provo you're like a provocateur versus like like you're provoking some sort of thing. I, I have some very good solutions actually, but, <laughs> 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 but I, I, I don't know. I, thi I think uh, I, there, there is another, another issue that, is, uh, that I'm a little bit concerned about, uh, that is the uh, kind of cathartic function that games have. So the, uh, this idea that you play a game and you play flowers and flower and uh, you're all like, uh, wow, I'm changing the world, uh, and then you end up with a beautiful world, but it's your world, the real world is still shitty, right? So I uh, like by portraying uh, the activists or like the, the the change in a game, uh, you risk uh, like kind of like uh, giving this uh, hypothetical like uh, solution, feel good solution, and then you go back and you're like, oh, yeah, I felt kind of good, you know. So um, I, I can't entirely tell if um, you, you're concerned just with games as, um, uh, as sort of a means to the end of social change or of uh, awareness or whatever, or if you value them um, as entertainment, but you certainly seem to value them uh, as a means. And I was wondering, uh, do, you, do you attempt to measure your rhetorical efficiency, so to speak? Uh, yeah. Um, no, uh, what I have is a number of hits and very quali qualitative uh, sort of anecdotal uh, assessment, like seeing what people say and just do it. I'm kind of curious to see if they get it or if what kind of like reaction they, they, they create. So I had, I had that. I used to take uh, uh, to, mm, to count like visits and stuff and see like how, how much they were. And I don't do that anymore because it's kind of a boring job. But no. Um, I, I'm uh, definitely uh, under the impression that uh, the measuring and assessing social change is very hard. Uh, or even like, um, this is something that, again, the serious game people tend to be very, very obsessed with. Uh, like how many people you get, how many actions, like subscribe this petition, and uh, uh, what, how do you quantify social change. And uh, you know, I don't think that social change uh, works that way. It's not a behavioral change, it's not something that you can sort of uh, extrapolate for, from numbers. Um, because you know, like there are definitely people who are even like more pissed off w once they play games. You know, like they are like, uh, oh, this, this is bullshit. This is like they are even more like reinforced in a, about like those fucking liberals that are controlling the, the media. You know, like um, so it's, it's it's definitely very hard to do that. And to me, there's just is is unmeasurable, essentially. Like, what is the uh, cultural impact of a song by The Clash? Like, I don't know, they are a politicized uh, band, right? And they probably moved some, like they create, generated some thought because uh, they are popular and they are influential and they influenced other bands as well that you might not know them, but you might know other bands that are descending from that. So that's to me, it kind of like 
it's all thrown into into the big culture. Or I can just say, oh, you know, when I when I launched a uh, phone story, nobody was talking about Foxconn. Uh, only some uh, some kind of like uh, liberal geeks blog uh, were uh, into into following basically the dark side of Apple. And then as soon as I as I launched that that, that sort of story blew up, and uh, it, it was on the headlines of everything. So I can say, oh yeah, I totally did that, but that's not that's not the case. Okay, so I'm not a gamer in the slightest, but I was taking class actually taught by the grads in this lecture hall, and they were saying how games have begun segueing as become like documentaries, and they gave some examples. I don't know the names, but they were, it was things like killing JFK or oh, recreating yeah. the shooters at Columbine, and I found them incredibly insensitive, but I feel like your games are provocative for a purpose, but I was wondering what your opinions were about. Uh, yeah, um, there, is, uh, there is this problem that in games you have, since you are like playing games, is basically performing the series of creation and you're so somewhat safe uh, when you're doing that. It's, uh, it's sometimes very hard to approach history, especially like a tragic aspect of history, uh, because the games kind of like, in the way they are uh, positioned in popular culture, they are considered to be trivial. And uh, in many extent, in some extent, are trivializing. So whatever you feed into a game, uh, it will sort of become uh, kind of like dumbed down. Uh, it's very easy to, to make simplifications and trivialization in the process of modelization of reality, especially through a games, because they are goal oriented, you know, so you're uh, there are a lot, so many issues that can, like so many uh, design choices that can go wrong and go in that direction and being like and uh, I, I believe both of those examples are, are interesting and uh, somewhat respectful at least in their intentions uh, there are other that are, that are terrible um, how can I say I see this as a deficit of language like the problem is that we still have to create the rhetorical and uh, language and design conceptual tools to deal with serious issues. And uh, like I make you an example, like it's it's how do you make a game about Holocaust? It's, it's hard, but um, people people try to do that, and with terrible. It's actually a pretty easy, a very gameable sort of situation if you are, if you are uh, basically a Nazi, because that kind of like at least the deportation work in a systemic way, like a, like a game. So you can definitely deal with that. In fact, there is a, a Nazi board games from the 30s, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, but how do you actually make a sort of like a Schindler's List uh, of, uh, of video games? That's uh, that we are still kind of working on that. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> is, this, is this the final boss no. of questions? Um, <laughs> well, I think just to to follow up on your question, I think. And, and your comments. I think one of the main problems with games and sort of how they deal with, let's say, difficult issues like Columbine, it has to do with identification and where the sort of the player or the viewer is positioned versus film, for example. So when you watch, let's say, a documentary or even a fiction film about, let's say, um, Nazi Germany, you know, you're there watching these characters do their thing, and whether it's documentary or not, you're outside of that. In a game, because it's playable, interactive, the, the game designer is sort of forced to place the player in a certain position. And it's very hard. I mean, Paolo's games, a lot of the ones we saw, they use like basically an ironic positioning. So you're placed as the bad guy, but it's very clear when you play that you're playing the bad guy and you're sort of revealing the system from that point of view and that's probably what you see as tasteful and clear. Um, in some of the other games, it's not so clear. That, that characterization in Columbine, you're playing the Columbine shooters, but you're not necessarily sort of... You're still controlling them though. 
Right. No, yeah. I mean, you are controlling mm -hmm. them, and that's where the problem is. You're like, oh, my God. Yeah. And that's where the perception is flawed, because it's not any longer a documentary about Columbine. It's now, wow, they made a game where you are the killer, and the pleasure of the game is about killing. So this idea that the protagonist, where you could easily, if you weren't, if Paula wasn't so clear about saying, well, yeah, it's the pleasure of, you know, oil industry building. If you took something a little more, you know, mm -hmm. a little more, um, I think, difficult to do that and weren't so clear, your reaction would be revulsion and you would blame the game designer for putting you in that position. So I think it has a lot to do with this, really the subtlety of where you position the player, if that makes sense. Because if it was like a simulation of Nazi Germany, Bitmappy, uh, mm -hmm. flat images. They're, they're vector. Oh, sorry. <laughs> they're vector, vector based. <laughs> See, I'm not a game. They eventually become bitmappy. <laughs> um, that allows you to to uh, address uh, pretty cruel situations with with still having a very light uh, way, a funny way, even to address them. Uh, Is that deliberate? I mean, yeah, I yeah, it's, it's deliberate. It's, it's part of uh, it's in part a practical choice because uh, it's definitely easier to just make like simplified graphics and sort of crank out games more more quickly, and that's also something that is uh, somewhat. I, I I will lie if I don't uh, mention the fact that it's uh, also related to the tools I use, um, and the tools I choose I, I choose to use. Uh, but yeah, there is this. Uh, um, I guess it's the same probably uh, process you have with South Park, uh, kind of like cutesy versus uh, serious. Then uh, in a way, it's, it's not trying to discourage you, like by like here, take that uh, a super serious uh, game. Uh, and like in fact, like now I try to get more into this, uh, more like bleak uh, and serious and less uh, less cutesy. Like this last one has a uh, main characters with this fake polygon face that is uh, not extract exactly cute. It's kind of like uh, ugly-ish. And, uh, and I like to sort of adventure into that, but it's still, uh, I mean, it's still a, a very in interesting negotiation because you don't want them to be like, oh, this is reality. And, and that's the, the relation with the, with the reality is also important to me. Uh, there is a, a realism that is uh, happening, that is being uh, promoted indirectly or directly by the proper game industry that is all about like polygon counts and uh, sort of like photorealistic surface. And so we use this term and uh, we use it too, like, oh, this game is very realistic, but we are really talking about uh, somebody call it realistic nest. So it's kind of like it looks, uh, it looks like that surface and photograph, like sort of photographic uh, realist realism, but it doesn't really uh, connect, I mean, it doesn't really represent systems and procedures in a realistic way. So the idea is, hey, don't look at the graphic. This is a cartoonish uh, representation. The other kind of realism, the other kind of stuff that I want to show is uh, kind of like beneath this surface. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. All right. Hi, I, I'm, when I think of Minifun Games, I, I, I think of you and Anna, Anthropy, and Stephen Lavelle, and all of your games are very small, independent projects that are made with basically no budgets, or very, very small budgets, and I can't seem to find big budget games that are also meaningful, so I wonder why do you think that's happening, and would you be able to make a meaningful game with say twenty million dollars, you know, <laughs> you know that. <laughs> I I've been asked this question before, like what what would you do if you if you had millions and stuff? Well, I'll be I'll be fucking getting an army and shit, and I will make it like actual activism if I had money. <laughs> no, uh, like you know, like I will be like um, starting a party or, or of some kind um so yeah this is like small small little little games made on in my bedroom as sort of like a venue for my frustration <laughs> but beside that um 
Yeah, I think you can make uh, uh, you can you can definitely make big budget games. I think we are we're probably get gonna get in the, in there. Like I think the um, games by that game companies are somewhat high budget, and uh, I mean it's something that it it will take it will take a while to sort of erode the structures that are happening that are basically. Uh, Making uh, making the gaming field way more conservative than, for example, the film industry, in which you have a, a comparable like you don't have big budget independent movies that are politicized, but still you have like a lot of mm, circulation and a lot of ideas and uh, you know like even like Wally -E is uh, kind of like political in a way or like um, definitely socially engaged and socially concerned. So I think it will it will eventually happen. Um, uh, to me, sometimes sometimes big budgets can be a little distracting, and uh, the reason why we have big budget games is that because somewhere between the 90s we switched from uh, designing games of all sort of kind, uh, like like all, all kinds of games, so we kind of like gradually switch into design uh, just a couple of types of games that are usually imply requiring to, I mean, they are implied to to have like some kind of three-dimensional world uh, in which you put a, a guy and this guy is controlled by the player and you do things uh, r related with objects and rolling boulders and shootings and throwing missiles and and sometimes uh, some kind of puzzle. So like the reason why we're a big budget game now, big budget games now is because we sort of adopted that and we sort of like we, like the <laughs> game people or the game industry essentially became a, a tool for technological obsolescence uh, and like becoming like, hey, we are gonna justify the fact that you're spending so much money on hardware and I, we are gonna justify it by Dumping a ton of content and a ton of high, high definition polygons in your game, so you you will be like, wow, that's that's pretty awesome. I like a, I like this PlayStation or Xbox. So, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're talking about that already with the iPhone games. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of the biggest killers. So that if you if you have a lot of money and you want to make a game, people are like, well, it's got to be on a console to the to, to get to people. And uh, it's really kind of a sad point now as we've gone kind of backwards in all these distribution models where PC gaming I think is just over. You know, download a game, install mm -hmm. it. Apple OS and the Apple Store, the fact that now everything, all the software is going to come from the computer through their store, authorized software. It's all pretty terrible. Actually. Yeah, so there is definitely a, a wall garden. Like, on one side, we are kind of like uh, taking away from the equation publishers that were considered kind of like the bad guys that are so reactionary that don't want to invest money in some weird uh, themes or some. Uh, untested genres but still you have a kind of like a comeback like you yeah you are somewhat independent but uh, the same uh, sort of forces are fencing out the marketplaces so they can still retain a, a control if you cross the line hard <laughs> hard to deal with no way you can ask can ask me question every day <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've noticed in your games that your female characters have pretty much been confined to us, sex objects and housewives. I thought perhaps you could speak <laughs> on what you view female roles in video games to be. Yeah, it's a good question, but I'm prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, here's, here's the thing. Um, uh, I've been asked this question before, even... Uh <laughs> <laughs> Even in uh, every every day, the same dream that has sort of like stereotypical roles in which the 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 the, the, the wife is just like a bitchy cooking uh, housewife, right? And that's ironic because that game is inspired by that girl there who's actually working in a cubicle all day while I kind of cook all the time. <laughs> that's what I do because I'm a teacher, uh, so it's not that I work. Um, so um, the the problem is. Uh, 
I can kind of speak for my condition. Like there are a lot of game authors that authors that, that kind of like to use the, the term, the formula, human condition to say like, oh, I want to make games that are really uh, connecting everybody in a, in a very deep level. And it's a kind of like a very tacky construct, the fact that there are uh, this uh, sort of like universal issues uh, dealing with, with humanity. And yeah, there are a couple of them, life, death, birth, uh, shitting, and eating. Uh, but everything else is pretty much culturally informed. And so like, the, my problem is that I'm a, I'm a male and uh, I kind of, um, I don't, r I'm not super comfortable in uh, sort of translating my, uh, my point of view to a female character. And um, I think the only solution is basically uh, promoting uh, game literacy and uh, try to push uh, uh, more women into like uh, the art of making games. And you can facilitate this process, and you can use the, your leverage if you are an institution. You can, you can like a non-profit institution. You can definitely do those things. And there are some uh, interesting efforts that are happening. So uh, the point is to like uh, uh, not to to like. The same issue can be can be like for race, like uh, why why there are no like uh, black people here? Because if I make a, <laughs> a game in which you are like a black dude, I'm, uh, it will it will be weird for me because there is a detachment from uh, like between subject and object of your investigation, and uh, because uh, because I'd rather have uh, uh, more black people or a more ethnically like racially diverse uh, uh, set of game designers and developers.